Welcome to Unfeared, a podcast of ghost stories written by women. Every fortnight, I grab my book or my iPad, my microphone, and find myself in a strange, ordinary place so that I can read you a ghost story. And today, I'm in a really ordinary place. I'm in a kitchen. I'm in my kitchen, in fact. How will I show you that I'm in my kitchen? Well, this is my drawers. You can hear that. I've got lots of interesting kitcheny things in these drawers. I've got a little stove top, which makes noises, like they do. I'm not going to put that on because when the fan goes on, it, I'll just have to wait for ages so that I can um, read the story. But yeah, that's my stove. Let's see what else have I got. I've got more cupboards and more drawers oh this one's a good one so this drawer it's so creepy so this is a cupboard of an, in an old kind of big sideboard thing and um, when i'm cooking sometimes that door opens on its own also i have these lights that are touch sensitive lights in the ceiling and um, because the ceiling's quite low and they sometimes switch on and off on their own I will leave it to you to think what might be happening there so why am I in a kitchen? kitchens aren't scary places there's nothing haunted in a kitchen surely or maybe not so our story this week is by Marjorie Lawrence it's, it's called The Haunted Saucepan what I like about ghost stories is that sometimes you find the most ridiculous things. Things that you just think, that's just a bit silly. And they can be really, really chilling. And they're chilling because they are ordinary, everyday things. And you put them in a, an uncanny situation and they become very, very sinister indeed. That's so weird. I've just seen something corner of my eye and it's a reflection in the window. <laughs> it's getting me. Jesus, help me. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start that one again. So this story is from a book called Women's Weird, Strange Stories by Women, and it's edited by Melissa Edmondson. It's published by Handheld. And um, I really like this book. If you've not read this anthology, it's got some brilliant writing in it. I would recommend it. Go on, get yourself a copy of it. Okay, so I am going to sit down and I'm going to read you The Haunted Saucepan by Marjorie Lawrence. It's quite a long story, this one. So give yourself a little bit of time. Get yourself a cup of tea, settle back and enjoy being scared. The Haunted Saucepan by Marjorie Lawrence. Yes said the long, lean man in the corner. I have had one odd experience that I suppose certainly comes under the heading of spook stories. Not that I ever saw the ghost. I never saw a real ghost in my life. But this was odd. Yes, odd. Tell you? Yes, of course, if you'd like, Saunderson. Ask that youngster by the drinks to pour me out another whiskey and splash, if she will. Thanks, Lloyd. Now then... Here's the yarn, and don't interrupt. I was hunting for a flat in London, say, about three seasons ago. A furnished flat, as I didn't know how long I was going to stay in England, and it wasn't worth getting my furniture out of store. Rents were pretty high in the district I wanted, somewhere about St James's or thereabouts, and I didn't want to go out far, as it was essential that I kept in touch with my business interests. I'd almost given up in despair and concluded that I should have to either go to a hotel or my club, when an agent rang me up and said he had a flat for me, he thought. The owner, a woman, was abroad. He thought I might find it just the thing. The address was just what I wanted, the rent almost incredibly low. I jumped into a taxi and rushed around to see it, feeling sure there must be a catch somewhere. But it was a delightful flat. Nicely furnished and as complete in every detail as you could wish. I was cautious and asked all sorts of questions. But as far as the agent knew, 
It was a straightforward deal enough. The lady was staying abroad indefinitely. The previous tenants had gone. Why did they leave? I wanted to know, but the agent played with his pencil and assured me he didn't know. Illness in the family made them decide to leave very suddenly, he believed. Well, at any rate, a week's time saw me settled in with my faithful man Strutt to do for me. You know Strutt, of course. One of the best fellows that ever lived. He plays an important part in the remarkable story I'm going to tell you. The first evening I spent there seemed too delightful for words after the discomfort and inconvenience I had been enduring in various hotels for the last six months. And I drew a sigh of enjoyment as I stretched out my legs before the fire and sipped the excellent coffee at my elbow. Strut had found me a woman of sorts to do the cooking. Marvellous fellow, Strut. And certainly she could cook, though the glimpse I had caught of her through the kitchen door as I went into the dining room proved her a dour and in truth most ill-favoured looking old lady with a chenille net, a thing I had thought as dead as the dodo holding up her back hair. I rang for some more coffee, and as usual, Strutt was at my elbow almost as my finger left the bell push. More coffee, please, Strutt. And, by the way, a very good dinner, I said carelessly. Where did you find this cook? She seems an excellent one. Strutt took up my empty cup as he replied in his usual, even voice, Is there anything quite so woodenly self-contained as the well-trained valet's voice, I wonder? She came one day to fetch something, a day or so before you came in, sir, and I was here getting a few things ready for you. We got talking, sir, and I found she was servant to the lady who owns the flat, and caretaker when she left. She seemed a sensible, useful sort of body, sir, and I engaged her. After trying to get references from the lady, sir, and failing, as nobody seems to know her address, I took liberty of exercising my own judgment, sir, and took her for a month on trial. I hope you think I did right, sir. Oh, of course, I said hastily, as indeed Strutt's judgment is invariably better than my own. I should say she's a find, if she can keep up this standard of cooking. All right, tell her I'm pleased. The door closed noiselessly, and I sank into a brown study. The flat was very silent, and the pleasant crackle of the flames sounded loud in the stillness, like little pistol shots. The deep leather chair was comfortable, and beneath the red lampshade rested three books I particularly wanted to read. With a sigh of satisfaction, I reached for one, and was in five minutes so deep in it that the entrance of Strutt, with my second cup of coffee, passed almost unnoticed, and I gulped it down heedlessly as I read. Buried civilizations have always been my hobby, though I've never had the money to go and explore in person. This book was a new and thrilling account of some recent diggings and discoveries, and I devoured the thing till I woke with a start to realise that it was after twelve and the fire out. With a laugh and a shiver, I struggled out of my chair, flipped on the full light, and poured myself out of whisky. The siphon hissed as I pressed down the jet and I cursed Strutt's forgetfulness. Most unlike him it was, too, as I saw it was empty. Perhaps there was another in the kitchen. I went along there to look, feeling rather peevish and very sleepy. The kitchen was flooded with moonlight, and all the pots and pans and bottles and things struck little highlights of silver. It was quite a pretty effect. There were several things on the stove, and I remember now that one, a little saucepan, had its lid not quite on, not fitted on levelly, I mean, and it had the oddest look for a moment, just as if it had cocked up its lid to take a sly look at me. I found a fresh siphon on the dresser, had a drink, and went to bed. My last thought, as I curled luxuriously between the cool linen sheets, was that the woman who had had this flat furnished and fitted it up so perfectly must have been a sybarite in her tastes, since I had yet to find the article in her flat that did not show the true lover of luxury. I wondered idly why she had left it, with all its contents, even to linen, plates, pots and pans, 
Then sleep came, and I sank into unconsciousness, my query unanswered. I must have slept some two hours, I think, when I was awakened by a sudden attack of pain, of all extraordinary things. I awoke, shaking and gasping, my hands alternately clutching my throat and stomach as the most awful gripping agony seized me, throwing me into convulsive writhings as the pain twisted me into knots and the sweat poured down my face, or fits of frantic coughing that I thought must surely split my lungs. I felt as though I had swallowed some ghastly acid that was burning my very vitals out. Feebly, I reached for the bell, but before I touched it, Strutt was in the room, awakened by my coughing and bending anxiously over me. My oh God, sir, what's the matter? You wait, me coughing. Wait a second, sir, and I'll get you a drop of brandy. The spirit spilled against my chattering teeth, for I was shaking like a man with ague, and my staring eyes were glazed with pain. Poor old Strutt's face was a study. He's always been very devoted to me. A few drops went down my throat, however, and after another dose of it, I seemed to feel a shade better, and lay back against the pillows, panting and shivering. My pyjamas were damp and streaked with perspiration, and now my perceptions were coming back to me, and I had begun to wonder why this attack, and what on earth had happened to cause it. Strutt bustled about my room, getting out a fresh pair of pyjamas his anxious eye flitting back to me every minute. No need to worry any further, though, as I was rapidly returning to my normal, healthy self, but this only made it stranger. Strutt approached the bed. Are you feeling better now, sir? If you'll take my advice, you'll change them damp things and let me rub you down before you go to sleep again. Feeling almost sound again, though still shaken from the memory of that ghastly ten minutes, I slipped out of the bed and stood lost in speculation, a strut rubbed me. Certainly back in bed in a few minutes in clean pyjamas with a stiff brandy and soda inside me, I could not understand what on earth could have attacked me so terribly, yet passed away so entirely, leaving no trace, for I felt as well as before the attack. Strut, I said, heaven only knows what was the matter with me. It can't have been anything I've eaten, since you've probably had the same and you're all right. But it was the most damnable attack. Fever's nothing to it. Besides, it wasn't fever. I've had too many bouts of that not to know it. I wonder if my heart's all right. I should have said so, sir, but it might be as well to see the doctor tomorrow. What sort of pain was it? You'll forgive me saying so, sir, but you look simply ghastly. I've never seen fever make you look so, sir, never. Strutt's voice held conviction. Moreover, the fellow had seen me through enough fever to know. I knitted my brows. What did I have? Clear soup. A sole. Piece of steak and vegetables. All well cooked. Oh, and a savoury. Mushrooms on toast. Mushrooms. I looked at Strutt triumphantly. For a minute, I thought I'd hit it mushrooms. She must have got hold of some poisonous stuff, not real mushrooms. It's easily done. Beg your pardon, sir, said Strutt firmly, but that can't be it. Being rather partial to mushrooms myself, sir, I took a few, and Mrs Barker did too. So that can't be the reason. There's nothing else you had, sir, borrowing your coffee, which I made myself. The second lot, at least, as Mrs Barker had gone home when you rang. I lay back on my pillows, silenced, but more puzzled than ever. However, I was too thankful to feel well again, to worry very much over the cause of my strange attack. And I can't worry any more over it, Strutt. Turn out the lights. I shall see the doctor in the morning. I did, and his report confirmed my own opinion, and added not a little to my puzzlement. I was as sound as a bell in every respect. Even the trace of occasional fever left by my long sojourn in the east seemed to have vanished. Old MacDonald punched me in the ribs as he said goodbye and grinned. Don't you come flying to me next time you get a pain under your pinny from a whiskey or two too many young fellow, me lad. Go for a good long tramp and blow it away. You're as strong as a young horse and as for heart, 
Don't you try to pull any of that stuff on me. You've got a heart that'll work like a dray horse and never turn a hair. I walked up St James's more puzzled than ever. What on earth had happened to me last night? In the light of my present feeling of supreme health and well-being, my last night's agony seemed more inexplicable than ever. Obviously, old Mac thought I had been more or less tight and exaggerated a nightmare into this. It was very irritating. Yet, I still had the vivid memory of that terrible, choking, burning sensation. The torturing pains that had gripped my frame, tearing and wrenching me, it seemed, till my very bones groaned and quivered within me. Good Lord, a dream? Still lost in thought about the whole curious affair, I ran full tilt into an old chum of mine on the steps of the club, George Trevanion, who seized me delightedly by the hand and poured forth questions. We dined together that night at the club and spent a long time yarning over the fire afterwards. When we parted, Trevanion had promised to dine with me the next night. I was, I admit, rather keen on showing him my new quarters. I had been so engrossed in talking shop, we're both engineers, and there had been so many things to say that I had forgotten to tell him, as I'd meant, about my remarkable attack of pain, an omission that annoyed me a little, as having spent thirty years knocking about the world, he might have been able to put his finger at once on the cause of it. There were some letters lying on the table in the dark little hall of my flat as I let myself in. I picked them up. Nothing interesting, only some bills and an invitation or two. I dropped them again and turned to hang up my coat. The kitchen door opened into the hall, and when I entered, it had been shut. Now I saw when I turned that it had swung noiselessly open, and I could see into the moonlit kitchen, the usual little place one finds in all these small flats. The gas stove was in line with the door, with the various utensils upon it ready for use in the morning. I think there was a large kettle and two saucepans, a big one and a little enamel one. The open door made me jump for a second, but of course I said draughts and thought so. I paused a second to light a cigarette, and the match dropped from my fingers and sputtered out upon the carpet. I held the unlighted cigarette between my fingers as I stared. As I am a living man, this is what I saw, or thought I saw. The saucepan, the little one on the stove nearest the door, seemed to lift its lid a shade. It seemed to tilt ever so slightly, cautiously, and from beneath its tilted lid, it looked at me. Yes, I... <laughs> I suppose it doesn't sound as horrible as I want it to, but I swear to you, that was the most eerie thing I ever saw or want to see. For a second, I stood cold and dumb, my mouth sticky with fright. Somehow, the utter banality of the thing made it even more terrifying. Then I swore at myself, strode into the kitchen and seized the saucepan, holding it to the light. It was, of course, a mere trick of light. I remember noticing the previous night how brilliantly the moonlight streamed into the kitchen, but good heavens, it had shaken me for a minute, positively. That attack last night must have upset my nerves more than I knew. Lord, what a fool. I put the saucepan back, laughing heartily, and going into the hall, picked up my letters again, still grinning at my own folly. I glanced back at the kitchen as I went along to my room. I could still see the stove and the silent row of pans upon it. The lid of the little saucepan was still askew. It still had the absurd air of watching me stealthily from beneath it. There almost seemed a menace in its very stillness. I laughed again as I got into bed. It seemed so lunatic, fancy being scared of a saucepan. Good Lord! A chunk of tin! An absurd piece of ironmongery! It just shows you what light and a few jangled nerves can do for one. I slept splendidly and awoke hungry as a hunter and flung myself into work that day like a giant, refreshed. 
Trevanion and I met at the club about 6.30 for a cocktail and had several cocktails. It was good to see the old man again. We'd been boon companions in all sorts of odd places and I really didn't know how much I'd missed him till we met again. We walked back to the flat about 7.15 and found a rattling good dinner awaiting us. I told Strutt to put Mrs Barker on her mettle and by Jove, she turned us out of feed fit for a king. Cream soup, oysters done with cheese, marvellous things they were, roast chicken and salad and a souffle that melted in your mouth. We were too occupied appreciating flavours to talk much at first. But at last, Trevanian sat back, regarding me with reverence, and drew a long breath of repletion. Man, you must be a perfect Croesus. Where on earth did you strike the cash to pay for this place, this feeding, and your cordon bleu in the kitchen, I should like to know? I grinned with triumph, sipping the last drops of my claret. Why, sheer luck, dear boy. The rent of this flat is a mere flea bite. The cook fell into my hands with the flat and, being a bit of an epicure, I feel justified in spreading myself a trifle in the feeding line, especially when an old companion in crime like you turns up. Trevanion's brow wrinkled. A flat in St James's? For a flea bite rental? Are you sure you're not being done somehow, old man? Seems to me almost impossible. I shrugged as I rose, and we sought our armchairs by the smoke-room fire. The reason why was still as obscure to me as ever, and after a while we dismissed the subject and began to talk of other things. Strutt brought in coffee and liqueurs, and the hours passed imperceptibly as we chewed our pipes and yarned over old times, adventures old and new. At last, Trevanion looked at the clock and laughed, putting down his pipe. Good Lord, look at the time. Time I got along to my place. Though I don't boast palatial quarters like these of yours, you lucky devil. Come and dine with me one night next week anyway. And I'll see if I can't raise a good drink or two for you, though I can't promise a dinner anywhere near your standards. He was standing by the door, his hand on the handle and I was on the hearthrug, knocking out the dottle of my pipe. Suddenly, we both fell silent, and his sentence broke off short as we stood listening. In the silence, down the passage, came the sound of something boiling. On the cold stove, black and silent, since Mrs Barker left two hours ago, we looked at each other, our mouths open with astonishment. Then... Trevanion laughed. What an odd noise. Just like a kettle or something boiling. Suppose your man's been making a drop of toddy for himself on the QT and left the thing on. For some reason, we stared at each other hard as he spoke. I know that I, for one, knew somehow that Strutt had not left the gas burning. The kitchen door was open, but from where we stood, we could not see into it. The smoke room door was round an angle. The moonlight streamed into the dark passage through the invisible open door, and with the moonlight came the distant sound of bubbling and boiling, like water in a kettle or saucepan. In the silence there seemed, however ridiculous it may sound, a sort of quiet menace in the sound. With a jerk I slewed round from the hearth and made towards the door. Probably it's only a draught. Wind bubbling through a crevice or something of the sort. Come on, let's see it at all events. Personally, the last thing I really wanted to do was go into that kitchen, that beastly kitchen, as mentally I had already begun to call it. Here was the door open again. Strutt assured me he had shut it when Mrs Barker left, and always did. There was something in the atmosphere of the whole flat now that I didn't like at all. But my funk was as yet not even definitely acknowledged, even to myself, and I strode down the passage with my chin set and round the angle into the kitchen. The bubbling sounds, clear and distinct, till the second I turned the corner, ceased on the instant. 
and dead silence succeeded. In the moonlit kitchen, Trevanion and I stared at each other blankly. The stove held only one utensil, the little enamel saucepan I had noticed before. But the gas beneath it was unlit. Its lid was closed down. Trevanion was rattling the window, examining the catch, a frown of bewilderment on his brow. I took up the saucepan, vaguely disturbed, and peered inside it. Empty, of course. Well, upon my soul, this is rum, said Trevanion, scratching his head. There doesn't seem to be a chink anywhere that could let in the draught. Air bubbling through a knot hole might make a noise like that. I suppose there isn't another gas jet left alight anywhere that might make a sound like water boiling. Is the geyser on? The geyser was not on, nor was there any other gas jet, the flat being lighted by electricity. At last, we gave it up as a bad job and gaped at each other, completely floored. Trevanion scratched his head again, then laughed and shrugged his shoulders as he reached for his hat. Well, it's the most extraordinary thing I ever knew. Still, there's probably some perfectly simple reason for it. Phone me when you find out, Connor, old man. It's left me guessing for the present and I'd really like to know what it is. Never heard anything so clearly, nor so odd, confound it. I think you must have some spook that boils water for its ghostly toddy. Trevanion's cheery laugh died away down the street and I slammed the door of the flat and stood for a minute, chin in hand thinking, damn it, something had been boiling. I take my oath, but what? As if in answer to my thought, a faint sound broke the stillness of the flat again, the bubbling of a boiling kettle or saucepan. Why was it that somehow I always thought of a saucepan when that sound started? It was faint at first, but grew more distinct as I listened, every muscle taut with strain. Now, whatever the damned thing was, I would catch it. The kitchen door stood ajar, of course. I had shut it when we went to look at the geyser, but it was open again when we came out of the bathroom. Undoubtedly, the sound came from the kitchen. Cautious, I took a step forward, though my back crept unaccountably as I did so and, craning forward, I peered round the door. The little saucepan stood where I had put it, on the stove, still cold and unlit, but it was boiling. The lid was rakishly aslant, and tilted a shade every second or so as the liquid, whatever it was, bubbled inside, and gusts of steam came out as I gaped, dumbfounded. Somehow, as I listened, the noise of the bubbling shaped itself into a devilish little song, almost as if the thing was singing to itself, secretly and abominably, chortling to itself in a disgusting sort of hidden way, if you know what I mean. I gave a half gasp of sheer fright, and do you know, instantly the saucepan was just an ordinary saucepan again, silent on the stove. I made myself go in, though I admit I was shaking with nerves. I took it up, cold and empty. Well, cursing myself for a fool, I took a stiff drink and, despite a horrible little shivery feeling that there was more in this than I liked, told myself sternly that I must have had one whisky too many. And mistaken light, and the noise a stray mouse might have made for the whole thing. I knew, of course, inside me that it wasn't so, and I had seen that abominable saucepan boiling some infernal brew, but I wouldn't admit it, and scrambled into bed with, I confess, considerable speed, and not a few glances over my shoulder into the dark. However, I slept well again, and awoke laughing at myself not a little, but with sneaking thankfulness that Trevanion had also made a bit of an ass of himself over the mysterious noise. I lay for a few minutes blinking in the shaft of sunlight that filtered through my blinds and reached for my watch. It was nine o'clock. Cursing strut for his laziness, 
I always had my bath at 8.30, confound him. I rang the bell. A shuffling step came along the passage, and the sullen, lined face of Mrs. Barker peeped in. I stared at her, then snapped, What on earth's the matter with Strut? It's nine o'clock. The woman studied me in silence with her narrow, secret eyes for a few seconds. What an old hag she was, really, I thought impatiently, then jerked her thumb over her shoulder. He stuck bad with summat, don't know what, been writhing and cursing like a good un. Her lips wreathed themselves into a mirthless grin, and I eyed her with even less favour than before. As she spoke, I heard a faint moaning coming from poor old Strut's room. Curtly ordering Mrs Barker back to her kitchen, I scrambled out of bed and went down the passage. Poor Strut was lying fully dressed on the bed, his lips blue and dry with pain, his limbs twitching convulsively. He was quite beyond speech, but his eyes implored help. I tore off his collar and shouted to Mrs Barker for brandy. The poor fellow's looks really frightened me to death. Bit by bit, we pulled him round. Though it struck me at the time that the woman's help was given none too willingly. And at last, Strut sat up, shaky but himself. I sat on the bed, staring at him, more concerned than I liked to say. What on earth happened, Strut? It seemed much the same sort of attack I had the other night. You'd better go and see my doctor. I can't have you cracking up like this. When did it come on? Strut cleared his throat, his voice still husky and strained with pain. Oh, I got up about seven, sir, as usual, or perhaps a little before. Mrs Barker was late, so I made myself some tea and boiled an egg. I hadn't eaten it so very long, sir, before I began to feel as if something was on fire inside me. Awful the pain was. I couldn't move nor cry out, not a word. I don't know what it was, sir, but I'll take my oath it's the same sort of thing you was taken with the other night. I frowned and meditated. Well, you'd better see MacDonald. This is beyond me. Strutt was duly overhauled by the doctor and reported sound in wind and limb. This fresh puzzle made me feel almost as if there must be something in superstitions after all, and there must be a curse on my new flat. I was still lost in speculation about it when I met Trevanion in Bond Street, very spruce and dapper, from lunching with the lady he happened to favour at the moment. He buttonholed me at once. Hello, Connor. Spotted your ghost yet? I shook my head. Spotted it? I wish I could. Listen, there seems no end to the extraordinary things that are coming my way lately. And I plunged into the story, beginning with my own attack of illness and winding up with what I had seen or thought I had seen in the kitchen after he had left and Strutt's mysterious collapse this morning. Trevanion listened intently, not laughing, as I half expected. Seems a queer place to discuss a bogey tale the corner of Bond Street on a fine spring morning, but it struck neither of us at the time. It's certainly odd, Trevanion said at last. It's the oddest yarn I've heard for a long time. Frankly, if it wasn't you, and if I hadn't heard that noise myself last night... I'd of course say it was too much whiskey and you were seeing things. But look here, I'll come up to your place tonight, say about 11.30, and we'll try an experiment. I've got an idea slowly working its way out. So long, old man. I was relieved he had not laughed, and guessed from his serious attitude toward the whole incomprehensible thing that he must have been more impressed than I had thought with the episode of the mysterious bubbling. What connection had that, if any, with the equally mysterious attacks of pain that had seized both Strutt and myself? The whole thing obtruded itself upon my work, which did not go particularly well in consequence, and I was still cogitating when the bell rang that night, and Strutt let in Trevanion, accompanied by a dog, to my great astonishment. We shook hands warmly. "'Didn't know you'd got a dog?' I said. But while you're about it, you couldn't have found a better specimen than this mouldy old semi-demi-collie. Trevanion 
grinned at me mysteriously. When Strutt had gone out of the room, he bent forward and whispered, This is the experiment. I gasped, and Trevanion went on as the old beast settled himself down in front of the blazing fire. First and foremost, may I give this old beast a feed? He's rather hungry, I'm afraid. It's the porter's dog from the club. I borrowed him for tonight. Yes, as you say, he's a bit of a cheese hound, but not a bad old beast. What about that feed? Of course, I said. I dare say there are some bones in the kitchen. I'll tell Strut. Trevanion stopped my upraised hand on the way to the bell. I don't want Strut, thanks, old man. I want to give this myself. Warm up some scraps for him. You know the sort of thing. I stared rather, then shrugged my shoulders. I knew Trevanion too well to ask him too many questions at the start of a thing. Oh, all right, my dear fellow, though I really don't see why this fuss about warm stuff. You sound as if the beast was a derby winner. I'm not as cracked as I seem, asserted Trevanion, going into the kitchen, now brightly lighted and as cheerful as could well be imagined. You leave this to your uncle Storky. It's all part of the experiment. I left him, rummaging in pots and pans, and betook myself to an armchair and my book on Egypt, till the entrance of my friend, the dog at his heels, licking his lips after his feed, interrupted me. Throwing himself down in the opposite armchair, Trevanion reached for the whisky. I cocked an amused eyebrow at him. Finished your incantations over the kitchen stove, Trev, I said, using my old abbreviation of his name. Trevanion laughed as he filled his pipe. You can pull my leg as much as you like, my dear chap, when we're through with this thing. It may be capable of an ordinary explanation, nine times out of ten it is, but there's always the faint possibility of the tenth time cropping up. Do you remember that case of the box that wouldn't keep shut when you and I were working on that road near Lahore? That was creepy, if you like. I nodded, silenced. For the moment I had forgotten that odd story, never fully explained. Trevanion went on. Well, I believe, from what I felt here the other night and from various other little things, more than ever, if the little experiment I've just tried on Ben here succeeds, I believe that we've got here one of the few cases of genuine queerness, something really uncanny, I mean. I interrupted him, my back creeping uncomfortably. What have you tried on the dog, then? Trevanion looked at me oddly. Fed him, out of the saucepan. The saucepan that bubbled, he said at last. My back crept again. Though I did not quite get what he was driving at, I stared, puzzled. But what... I don't quite see your drift, Trev. What would that show you? If I'm right... We shall soon see, Trevanion returned. But I don't want to tell you all my ideas entirely before we've got through the end of this sitting, as they might colour your impressions. And I want to leave your mind as open as possible tonight. Now about twelve, I propose that you and I and old Ben shut ourselves up in the kitchen and see if anything happens. I believe if we're right, and there is something more to this than the things of everyday life, the dog's behaviour will show it. Beasts are much more susceptible to psychic influence than we are, especially dogs and cats. At any rate, it's worth trying to see if he does seem to sense anything. If he does, that will prove that you and I are not both slightly off our jumps. A strangled gasp from Ben interrupted him, and like a flash, we turned. The poor old dog was in convulsions of mortal agony. His eyes starting from his head, writhing and twisting and snapping wildly at our hands as we tried to help him. I rushed for brandy and warm milk, and between us we got him round and sat back staring at each other, our skins prickling faintly with a horrid little fright. At least mine was. I am dead right in my first guess, I think, Trevanion said soberly, stroking the head of the still panting and exhausted dog. Poor old Ben, then. I boiled some scraps in that infernal saucepan. It was hard on Ben, 
but I had to find out somehow whether my idea was right. And by Jove, it is. Everything cooked in that thing half poisons people or gives them an attack like poisoning. Do you think there's something in the paint? I hazarded. Trevanion was not sure. It was only an ordinary enamel saucepan. He didn't think so. Ben lay panting on the rug before the fire, still rather a wreck, but regaining his strength every minute. I stooped down and patted him. We shall have to give him another five minutes or so to recover, said Trevanion. Poor brute. Never mind, he'll be all right in a jiff. I don't mind telling you, though, that it will take us all our nerve to face that kitchen and that infernal saucepan. That bubbling noise was quite the most unpleasant and disturbing thing I ever heard. The actual homeliness of it seeming to hide a sort of sinister meaning and the purr of a boiling kettle is such a jolly thing as a rule. I nodded. I didn't want to think about it over much just then, to tell the truth, so I resolutely hunted out cards, and we played poker for half an hour or so, till Strutt came in with a fresh siphon and, with his usual correct, anything more, sir, good night, sir, went off to his own quarters. Trevanion, with a glance at the clock, it marked just twelve or a few minutes before, got up and waked the old dog, who was sleeping by this time, with his chin on his paws. It was twelve o'clock. In silence, we turned the lights low and tiptoed along to the kitchen. The door was open, of course, but otherwise the whole place looked demure to a degree. We had brought cushions and rugs with us and threw them into the corner, the furthest away from the stove, near the window, from where we could watch both door and stove and saucepan without being too close. I felt, as usual, a horrid little reluctance to enter the room, but Trevanion's large presence went a long way towards scotching that. Besides, I meant to see what we might see, however I funked it, Settling ourselves down, I rummaged in my pocket for my pipe and realised the dog was not with us. Trevanion craned out from his corner, calling softly. The old beast's eyes gleamed from the shadows in the hall beyond. He put a cautious nose across the threshold and retreated at once, ears flat. Trevanion looked at me and nodded. You see, there is a funny atmosphere here. Come on, Ben, old man, come on. By dint of much coaxing, the dog crept into the room, unwilling enough but obedient, and we made room for him beside us. But he would not lie down, and kept raising his head and sniffing the air, his eyes watchful, puzzled, and full of a vaguely stirring fear. The silence grew steadily as the minutes passed. Even the occasional low-toned remarks we exchanged to start with died into the all-enveloping silence, and we puffed our pipes solemnly, our eyes glued to Ben's shaggy head. The air seemed to grow steadily colder too as we sat there, despite the warmth of the spring night air that stole through the slightly opened window as the silence deepened, the cold seemed to intensify too. There seemed to come a cold, dumb menace into the atmosphere that fastened upon us so gradually that we scarcely perceived its beginnings till we were surrounded, soaked in it. My hands were frozen, and my mind too seemed to have grown cold and numbed. Trevanion told me later he felt just the same. Ben's yellow hair was fluffed out into a ruff around his head. His wary eyes, old but alert, wandered ceaselessly round and round the little kitchen. The moonlight, flooding the whole place with eerie white light, helped the general uncanny effect. The shadows lay sharp-edged, black, behind every piece of furniture. The grandfather clock seemed to hide a long, lean thing that peered furtively at us with narrow, horrible eyes. 
Trevanion moved his leg and coughed. Our eyes met, and I read the same thought in his mind. Was the silence, helped by our vivid imagination, already overexcited by the episode of poor old Ben, going to work on our nerves till we made shapes and sounds out of mere shadows and the silence of the night? At this moment, the dog suddenly decided for us. With a faint woof of uneasiness, he sat up, his eyes on the open door. I could hear nothing, but obviously his ears, more finely attuned to degrees of sound, had caught something in the dark flat that vaguely distressed him. Ordinarily, any dog would have promptly gone out to investigate, but Ben remained, stiff poised, his head held forwards, his paws braced against the floor. Trevanion nudged me to watch him, but I did not need it. Then suddenly the dog flattened himself down between us, his head low, his eyes fixed on the door, shivering in every limb. At the same moment, it seemed to me that I heard a faint movement in the darkness beyond the door, very faint but definite. The sound, it seemed to me, of a door being shut with the most delicate care so as to avoid any possible creaking or snap of the latch. The exquisite caution of the sound made it peculiarly horrible. I felt my hair rise as I strained my ears, wondering if the sound could possibly be my imagination. The pause of silence that followed was almost worse. It was like the pause made by someone having shut the door, waiting outside to be certain they were not heard. I took a firm grip of myself, glanced at Trevanion. His hand was cold too, but we were both steady enough. We waited. As a matter of fact, I doubt if we could either of us have moved then. We were held in the fascination of fear. Suddenly, Ben gave a terrified whimper and burrowed wildly into the rugs. Another sound broke the awesome stillness, a faint movement in the passage at the far end on tiptoe, pausing for greater stealth. Something stole towards the kitchen door. The cold draught seemed to grow even colder. It lifted our hair and stirred Ben's rough coat. My flesh crept softly and horribly on my bones as I gripped Trev's clammy hand and stared at the door, setting my teeth as the thing in the passage trailed softly nearer and nearer. I say trailed because that so neatly describes the sound. A faint footstep accompanied by a soft rustle like a trailing skirt. At this moment, I became aware of another phenomenon. There grew a heavy scent in the air, like patchouli, I think. At any rate, a definite perfume that seemed to herald whatever approached. Our throats dry with fright. We shrank close to each other, staring at the dog as he moaned and whimpered, and the steps drew near and paused outside the kitchen door, as if whoever walked that night stood still to peer at us through the crack of the door and laughed at us through the chink. For sheer terror, that beat all I had ever known. Yet still, the spell held us both motionless, staring, as Ben, shaking, his eyes bulging, slowly raised himself as if to face something. Dead silence. Neither Trevanion nor I could see a thing, but the dog's eyes, fixed about five feet from the floor, followed someone who entered. The moonlight lay white and sheer, unbroken across the kitchen floor, yet someone entered, paused, and walked towards the stove. As our terrified eyes followed Ben's, fixed on the invisible, there came the faint click of a cautious hand moving among the pots and pans on the stove, and suddenly, upon the silence, broke a sinister little sound. The clink, 
of a saucepan lid carefully lifted. My eyes bolting, dumb, I gaped as I dreaded the lid of the little saucepan was just raised and from beneath it there seemed to steal a faint curl of steam, thin and blue and horrible. It seems an absurd thing, but this just finished me. The spell of sheer terror that had held us both broke, and with a yell of mortal fear I flung aside the rugs and bolted past that horrible stove like a maniac, Trevanion at my heels, blundering madly over poor old Ben as he ran. We gained the smoke room, and slamming the door upon the horror that ruled that uncanny kitchen, we sank into two chairs, sweating with fright. I was white and clammy, and Trevanion's hand shook against the glasses as he poured us out each a stiff tot of whisky. Even now in the silence there stole upon the air that vile sound of bubbling. There was almost a note of meditation in it now, as if the soul behind that hateful little purring noise was pleased, and sat grinning to itself, planning new evil, a mocking, threatening little note. Oh, it was beyond words, vile and awful, that sound. And to know, as now we did know, that something, someone, did actually, sans human light, gas, or anything of that sort, set a boiling in that horrible little saucepan, some devil's brew of some sort, every night of the Lord I'd spent in that flat? My skin crept again as I thought of it, and I took a hasty gulp of whisky. Trevanion's voice broke the silence, still rather shaky. Well, I said you had a spook, Connor, and by Jove, you've got a beauty. I frankly admit I am not going past the door of that kitchen again tonight. I am claiming a shakedown on the floor if you can't sleep too in your bed. His laugh was rather harsh, but it served its purpose, and I shook myself together. Putting down my glass, I patted Ben, his rough hair now beginning to lie down and the light of terror fading from his eyes. In the distance, but more faintly, still purred that infernal sound. What is it in the name of the Lord, I ejaculated. Trevanion's normal senses were rapidly returning. He lit a cigarette. I don't know for certain, but we must interrogate your man Strutt. I think you'll find he knows more about this than you think. He passed the door of the kitchen when I was feeding Ben, and I saw him jump and look at the saucepan in a furtive sort of way. I pretended not to see him. Then... He glanced at the shelf where it sometimes stands and looked puzzled. I'm going to pump him. Obviously, the whole thing centres around that infernal saucepan. Anyway, we're both too knocked up to do any more tonight. Let's turn in and we'll thrash the whole thing out tomorrow. We slept like logs. Trevanion on the couch in my room, buried in rugs and pillows. I woke to broad daylight and strut at my shoulder with a cup of tea. I always had a weakness for early tea, feminine though it sounds. Trevanion was already awake. As my man turned to hand him his tea, Trevanion looked up at him. Strut, he said, did you boil the water for the tea in the saucepan? There was a pause, and Strut's eyes first blank, then full of a passionate relief, stared back at Trevanion's intent blue ones. You know, sir? Then thank God I'm not mad. I turned sharply. What? Strutch, you must have seen something too. Seen something, sir? Well, gentlemen, if you knew what a relief it is to know you know and don't think me crazy nor drunk, well, I can't tell you what it is. The past two days have been fair hell. Beg your pardon, sir, but it's true. And I didn't dare tell you, sir, for fear you'd think I was mad or I'd been drinking. Strut's strained eyes, blue circled, told their own tale, and the passionate, almost tearful relief in his voice was nakedly real. I felt a very definite admiration for Strutt, 
as I realised what terrors he must have fought down all alone during the past few days. Trevanion nodded, his eyes alert with interest. Go on, Strutt. This is most interesting. Now tell me, when you made the coffee for Mr Connor the first night he was here, did you use this saucepan for boiling or a kettle? Strutt's eyes looked back unflinchingly at Trevanion's. I think we both knew his answer before he said it, though. The saucepan, sir. The kettle was leaking. The little enamel saucepan, the... The one that that boils, sir. Strutt's voice suddenly sank to a dreadful whisper, and although it was broad daylight, we involuntarily shuddered. And the day you were taken ill? My man nodded. Yes, sir. I'd boiled an egg for my breakfast in it. I've wanted to speak to you about all this before, sir, but it all seemed so crazy I didn't like. I was afraid if I told you all I'd seen and heard, you'd think I'd taken to drink, sir. Lord, not now, I said fervently. After last night, I believe anything of this infernal flat. Go on, Strutt, for goodness sake. Tell us all you know about the thing. Don't keep anything back. Well, sir, the first night I come in here, the night you were taken ill, I left your room to see if everything was all right, and I heard something singing in the kitchen like a kettle on the boil, bubbling and steaming like. I thought, well, I must have left something on, or Mrs Barker. But I went in and blessed if everything wasn't quiet, and as cold and dark as Egypt. Not a sign. Well, I was scared, but I thought I must have been half asleep. But I got back to my room and left the door open, and in a few minutes the same noise come again. I tiptoed out then, sir, you may bet, to try and catch whatever made that noise. And round the corner, I could see this little saucepan boiling away like fury. You don't think I'm drunk, sir? By George, we don't. I don't. Go on. What did you do? I went in, sir. I don't mind saying it took a lot of doing. I'd have given a month's salary not to, but I didn't want to feel done. And I still thought I must be seeing things. Well, sir. The minute I stepped round that door, that blamed thing stopped dead, as true as I'm standing here. Wasn't even warm. Well, I bolted back to my room, and that's a fact. Well, in the morning, I thought I must have been mad or seen things. But I didn't like the look of that saucepan, till I got to feel it was behaving silly to act so, and I boiled that egg in it to show I didn't care. Well, after I was took ill like you, sir... I said I wasn't going to meddle any more with the beastly thing, and I took and I threw it in the dustbin. But last night it was back again, and begging your pardon, sir, I wouldn't touch the thing if I was you. There's something about it not right. Don't you touch it. Strutt's troubled voice ceased, and Trevanion's eyes met mine. He nodded. You're right, Strutt. All you say goes to prove my theory. Obviously, Everything cooked in that thing produces acute symptoms of some sort of poisoning. Arsenical, I should say. But we can find out the details later. Now, what in the world is the story connected with this saucepan? I take it all the things here belong to the woman who had this flat before. Well, yes, sir, so I understand. Mrs Barker was with her a long time and took care of the place when she left. I heard yesterday what we didn't know when you put in for this flat, sir, that three lots of tenants had had it and left very sudden. I did hear that one or two of them fell ill all of a sudden, and I'm certain this saucepan will be at the bottom of their going, sir. Anyway, the none of them stayed more than a month or so. Mrs Barker. Mrs Barker, mused Trevanion. Now... I wonder whether that old soul knows anything. As he spoke, there seemed a faint shuffle outside the door, and bouncing out of bed, I flung it open. Mrs Barker herself was outside, her wrinkled, wicked old face alive with rage and fear, her knotted hands twisted in her apron. We all stared. Then Trevanion seized her wrist, as she tried to glide away. No, you don't, old lady. What were you listening for, I should like to know? She eyed him, 
sullenly and venomously, but vouchsafed no reply. Dragging her into the room, Trevanion shut the door determinedly. Look here, there's something here I don't like, Connor. Do you suppose this is all a plant by this old hag for reasons of her own? I shook my head, still blank. Evil old woman as she looked now, her face all twisted with hate, I did not see how in the world she could have been responsible for all the strange things we had, the three of us, witnessed the last few days. You know something, Trevanion said sternly. Now you tell us the whole truth about this beastly business and it'll be all right for you. If not, I shan't tell you. Besides, there ain't nothing to tell, the old woman answered sullenly. Strut suddenly interrupted her. You're lying. I beg your pardon, sir, but I seen her laugh when Mr Connor was to kill. Now, you wicked old sinner, you tell all you know about this, as you're told, or... I'll make you eat something cooked in that saucepan. It was horrible. The hag crumpled like a shot rabbit at the threat and put up her trembling, gnarled hands. Her deadly terror was dreadfully sincere. I put up my hand. All right, Strut. Let her go, Trev. She'll tell us. Her voice, shaky and strained, sullen but vanquished, the old woman began her story. Shall I ever forget that scene? The untidy room, Trevanion and me in pyjamas drinking it in while Strutt, immovably correct as ever, with his back to the door she talked. The story was incomplete. Much had to be taken for granted, but it was a sufficiently grim picture that she conjured up before us of her late mistress. Young, beautiful, hard as marble, an old husband standing between her and her own ends, a lover, lovers, and riches to be gained by his death. One lover, a doctor, a mysterious packet of powder seemed to be given by him to the woman one day when the old woman was prying around. Then the empty paper, found thrown away with a few grains of white powder in the creases. Afterwards, gradually weakening health of the husband, only helped by the constant solicitude of his young wife, the apple of his eye. She was tireless in her goodness to him. How many times did she not rise in the middle of the night to brew soup or tea or anything he fancied? At last he grew so that he would take nothing she had not prepared. His attacks of pain were terrible, folks said seemed to twist him all to pieces. Hart, the doctor said, the young doctor that was Madame's friend, was attending him. And he and Madame used to laugh together on the stairs when he left the old man. Then the death of the husband and hasty burial. The doctor was crazy about Madame. And one night, Mrs Barker heard them planning to be married very soon. She told him she was making her will in his favour and laughingly insisted he should return the compliment. He did. And Mrs Barker was called in to witness it. They were very merry together. And Madame insisted on making some of her special punch for him to drink to the happiness in. Madame came laughing into the kitchen and seemed to talk and laugh even to the saucepan as she boiled the water for the punch. She sent Mrs Barker away then, but the doctor never got his honeymoon. Next day, he was found dead in the flat. And Madame was away with another man, a Spaniard she was running an affair with at the same time. No, they said it was heart failure. But Mrs Barker, well, she thought a lot of things she didn't say. What was the use? And Madame left her instructions to take care of the place till it was let. And it was a good job. But she never fancied anything cooked in that saucepan somehow. Put it up on a shelf till one day the new tenants used it and got sick and left. Same thing happened again with the next people. And they used to say they saw things and heard the kettle or something boiling when there was nothing there. Yes, Madame used a funny scent, began with a P, but she couldn't say the word. All over the place it was some nights. 
couldn't say she'd actually ever seen anything. She took good care to go to bed early when she was living in the flat, and anyway, it never came further than the kitchen. Yes, defiantly, she had used the thing on purpose once or twice. She was a poor woman, and caretaking was a good job when you got a post like this and no one to interfere. Yes, she had used it before to scare out tenants because she wanted to stick to her job and she didn't care. There were lots of other flats in London. No, she, it never came unless that there saucepan was there on the stove as it used to be. Yes, she'd missed it the day Strutt threw it into the dustbin and looked about there till she'd found it and reinstated it. Of course she wanted us to go, like the rest. The agents were so sick of tenants leaving that they'd said if we went, they shouldn't bother to let the place again. Sorry? Why should she be? Nobody never died of it, what she heard of. Only got attacks like the old man used to get. The door closed on her dismissed figure and Trevanion's stare met mine. Gingerly, we went into the kitchen and picked up the saucepan. Smooth, and harmless-looking instrument of a ruthless woman's crimes. Gingerly, I handed it to Strutt. For heaven's sake, tie a stone to the vile thing, Strutt, and sink it in the Thames or burn it. Get rid of it somehow. We seem to have struck one of the most unpleasant stories I ever heard. However, once rid of this, I don't think we should be bothered any further, as obviously this horrible little thing is the germ of the haunting, which indeed was true. The ghostly bubbling and boiling never troubled the flat more, nor did the kitchen door persist in opening. The ghost was laid. But I often speculate on the fate probably in store for the unfortunate wretch, now in love with the woman whose white hands once brewed death for her husband and lover in that uncanny saucepan. And that's The End of the Haunted Saucepan by Marjorie Lawrence. I hope you enjoyed that. It's a long story, isn't it? I like this story, but oh my God, the things they do to that poor dog, poor Ben. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, then please like it. Please tell people about the podcast. Um, Share it with whoever you think would be really interested in listening to to a story about a scary saucepan. If you want to know more about Unfeared, then pop over to our coffee page. That's coffee, K-O-F-I dot com slash unfeared. And you'll be able to find information about the writers, some behind the scenes pickies and tidbits. You can help support the show by buying us a coffee. There'll be links to the book that I've read this story from, Women's Weird, edited by Melissa Edmondson. And I'll leave this episode by saying take care, look after yourself, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Unfeared, a podcast of ghost stories written by women, is researched and hosted by Jacqueline Gavitas, with sound and production by Martin Parker.